Hello, my name is Hinata Seen. I work as a consultant adult psychiatrist and I'm also the general adult faculty member for the SAS Doctors Committee. This is one of the short interview series uh, for discussing SAS Doctors opportunities and barriers with trust and um, national leaders across medicine. And today we have with us Dr. Amrit Sachar, a leading psychiatrist. Um, Amrit is a liaison psychiatrist at uh, West London NHS Trust. And she is also currently the joint presidential lead for equity and equality at Royal College of Psychiatrists. And she has also been awarded London Psychiatrist of the Year. Amrit, thank you so much for thank joining. Um, and huge congratulations on this very, very well deserved role. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for being. For, uh, I'm really grateful for being invited. Thank you, Amrit. Um, Amrit, um, starting really with your new role, uh, can you tell us a bit about your role as equity and equality lead and how this aligns with promoting diversity and inclusion within the psychiatry field? Yeah, so um, I the, the previous um, two post holders, um, were our current president, Lade Smith and Raj Mohan. Um, and I worked with them as one of the equality champions. So during their tenure, um, their three year tenure, they um, created um, an equality champions network, which was basically um, somebody had been put forward from each of the faculties and each of the devolved nations and each of the divisions. Yeah. Um, so I first kind of got involved in the college work through through that route. Um, Raj and Lade were both incredibly um, uh, passionate about this issue and really collegiate in the way that they invited all of us to be a part of it. And that's what led me to um, apply for the national role. What we what um, we achieved in the last three years was um, a number of things, but one of them was the tackling racism in the workplace guidance um, and the Act Against Racism um, campaign, um, which has 15 actions in it. And three of those actions refer to um, what we call specific medical um, cohorts. Um, so those are the two medical cohorts, basically, that are highlighted in the medical workforce um, race equality standards. One is IMGs or International Medical Graduates, and the other is SAS doctors. And the reason uh, so um, two of our actions um, pertain to SAS doctors. So one is um, making sure that your organisation um, understands the specific um, needs and barriers for SAS doctors. And the second is um, to ensure that the SAS charter is delivered. Um, so that was just launched uh, um, as the two presidents handed over. Um, yes. So that's been out there for a month or so. Um, so going forward, um, the role for Raj and me um, as the new joint leads, presidential leads, will be to ensure that that's implemented okay. because you can produce documents and guidance all over the place. So it's really to work with organisations in a kind of formative way, um, we know that threatening them isn't going to really engage them. And we don't have the power in the college to do that. Um, so we want to work with organisations to uh, meet them where they are sure. and move forward uh, with that particular, those particular actions. Very close to my heart. Excellent. You actually answered already like four of my questions. that I have. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but thank you so much, Amrit. It's excellent. Um, if again, because it's for the wider wider audience, it's not only for psychiatry. Uh, yeah. um, really, this interview series. So, from in your vast experience and from your perspective, how have what do you think? How have uh, SAS doctors evolved and established their pivotal role in our psychiatric landscape? I think. Um, so let me tell you from my so I am honoured to be called um, a SAS ally. Um, and I've come on a journey with that. So I am I have to be humble and um, be open about where I started off. Mm -hmm. um, I started off being 
um, having some of the negative views about uh, assumptions about SAS doctors that a lot of people have. Um, I feel ashamed that that is the way that I felt. Um, but um, one of the things that I'm really passionate about in my uh, equity and equality role is that those of us who are in positions of pro privilege um, shouldn't just be paralysed by our shame or our guilt. We need to turn that into action. So that's why I feel it's really important for me to be open about where I started on this journey. Um, I, my epiphany came only a few years ago at a BIPA, a, a British Indian Psychiatrist Association conference, um, where there was a talk about SAS doctors. And I just thought, oh, my God, I'd never really thought about it in this way, that SAS, that the history, the colonial history of SAS doctors is that there weren't enough um, consultants in the NHS when it was first formed. Um, people from the colonies were invited to come and make up those um, gaps. Um, but uh, the consultants in this country didn't want those people to be called consultants. So they were given different roles, as I understand it. Um, and so um, there's always been a much higher proportion of people in those roles who are IMGs. There's always been a much higher proportion of people in those roles who are minoritized ethnic backgrounds. Um, and uh, those two things kind of feed into each other so they don't have much of a voice and so they've always been the stalwart workhorses of the NHS um, and it just seems to feel like it carried on being that that was okay um, and some of the work I've done locally talk kind of doing workshops in my organisation to speak to SAS doctors about how to make their getting them to tell us how they want things to be different um, and this is how I came across Lily Reed um, and Rob Fleming who's a SAS anaesthetist who are both quite vocal on Twitter um, that there's a lot of people who are choosing to be SAS doctors it's not because they can't do um, the traditional route and um, mm. they've made an active choice and very um, trendy hashtag says by choice yes Twitter. absolutely <laughs> so they've made an active choice um they've chosen lifestyle whatever they're all uh, what a lot of people have said to me i'm not interested in leadership i'm not interested in all of the i just want to deliver good care excellent mm -hmm. care um and yeah i i every time i speak to sas doctors i'm more and more um blown away by their dedication actually um uh, so I suppose one of the things that I've learned and I would urge people to think about is that they are not a homogeneous group yes. um they are driven by lots of different um uh reasons for being SAS doctors and um lots of different things that they want to achieve in their lives and we need to be able to um see all of that and, and nurture it Absolutely. Thank you, Amrit. Gosh, it's amazing to have an have a SAS ally, really. <laughs> when I spoke with Lily, she did say I'm giving you the easiest interview because. It's <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, Lily's uh, been Lily's been wonderful. So she invited me to uh, she reached out to me. Um, Twitter is such a great place to make friends. Um, but um, yeah, it's been it's been wonderful working with her. Um, uh, she's really opened my eyes and yes. it's been an honor, actually. Super. And because you talked about us knowing and speaking with so many SAS doctors, can you share any success story or actually someone who has delivered an excellent patient care um, from SAS perspective? Oh, um, so I don't actually in my own trust, I don't I, in my own service, I don't have any SAS doctors. We managed to convert um, one role into a SAS doctor for the first time in my service line. Um, probably no, it's not a success story, but I'll tell you about it because it's been a great learning point for me. Um, it was um, an IMG with a significant disability. So, uh, and a, a woman, so, and a SAS doctor. So, so many intersectional issues. Um, 
And what struck me with that was that just how um, poorly prepared our systems were to be able to support um, the transition. And sorry, I'm not answering your question at all. I'm answering the question that I want to answer. <laughs> but it just reminded me, I, I'm, I've become increasingly of the opinion um, that if we are going to tackle inequalities, whether it's in the workforce or um, for our patients, um, we need to design things around the most marginalised and the most disadvantaged and the most intersectional. Um, because otherwise, every time we design an initiative to improve things, if we don't factor in the most marginalised people, the people who have the most barriers, um, actually what you do is you make things better for the people who are already doing all right. So you're widening disparities and you're leaving those people behind. So I kind of think we need to it's really tempting for us to design around the 80 percent, but um, I kind of think we need to turn it on its head a little bit. Um, success stories, uh, not so much about, I mean, OK, what the, uh, my um, colleague SAS um, development tutor in my trust mm -hmm. won SAS um, Doctor of the Year for mm -hmm. RC Psych um, London as well. So he his work has been honoured. Um, and um, we work together to try to engage our SAS doctors in our in my trust because they were one of the things that happens inadvertently if your um, role and your mindset is just about getting your head down and delivering the service mm -hmm. it's really hard for them to connect with each other um so we created a couple of um workshops where we got we we made it almost impossible for their line managers not to be able to to la allow them to attend and okay. that was a really beautiful thing um watching these people connect with each other for the first time and going I, I you know we work in we work in neighboring services and we've never met before um and just finding that kind of um camaraderie and um joint experience was that that felt really wonderful to observe so i feel like um it was a way of us being able to reward start to reward and recognize um so, them as important super excellent and, and then you trust um just uh, your organization where you, where you work with um and are there any sas doctors who have been assigned the roles of um, education supervisors for psychiatry trainees i know there are a lot of mental health trusts where they do assign the supervisor roles for foundation doctors and for gp trainees but not so much for psych trainees yeah, no, we don't have that at the moment, but it's one of the things that we're working towards. Um, so we're working towards all of the things in the SAS Charter. Um, and um, that we're getting there, we're moving towards it. The, the, the main thing is that we um, have, um, so we have Evan Picton Jones, who is our SAS development lead, who's the SAS thing. Um, Doctor of the Year, um, who is wonderful. Um, and we have um, Derek Tracy, who's our medical director, who's uh, sponsoring this work. Um, so we have the commitment at the leadership level. Um, so now it's about working with our director of medical education and working with um, uh, our consultants to start delivering that. That's we're on a journey with that. Great. Everybody seems to be on the same page, so that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about leadership opportunities, do you think your trust uh, advertises all the leadership and management posts? Uh, and do they include SAS doctors and not just... Yeah, so what we've had to do, it, it's it's been in the, it's only been in the last couple of years. So the other role that I have in the trust is um, medical workforce race equality standards lead. So that's the NRES lead. Um, so that's the that's the role that's allowed me to have time to work with Evan. Um, and we've also just appointed two IMG tutor leads. Um, so we now we have a little network of leads who can start doing this work. And one of the things that we did a couple of years ago was start looking at all of our adverts that sometimes deliberately, but sometimes inadvertently were um, advertising consultants only. So um, we were just uh, 
calling that out yeah. and saying, yeah. let's not have these exclusion, right. this language of exclusion. It takes time, but as long as some work is being done towards it. That, that's yeah, fine. yeah. Excellent. Um, and um, I, do you have any Caesar mentor at all in your trust or is working or helping? So I, I think um, that is all of this falls under um, Evan, our SAS um, development tutor. And um, so I think his role um, has been kind of to do everything um but now he's getting in a bit more support um and he's um lobbying with uh, my support and Derek's support to start looking at these other roles but at the moment he's been all things to everyone unfortunately no that's excellent brilliant um uh, and just uh, for the interview sake how many SBA sessions do you think uh, as SAS doctors have in your trust so that's the other that we're, we are um, in the process. Uh, we're, we're auditing and re-auditing um, as the SAS charter goes. And um, what we're struggling with is even getting the job planning. So the audit on job planning completion is not where we would like it at all. Um, and then I think there is um, a piece of work to be done uh, between what um, SAS doctors are told they can have as SPAs mm. and then what they actually end up get, getting. Um, but I think we've got variation. So we've got about 40 SAS doctors um, across uh, eight service lines and um, they all have slightly different job plans. Mm. Um, so it's about trying to get all of them up onto the standard. But part of it is also ensuring and empowering them to know what their rights are um because one of the things we're finding is that they don't they don't get the same level of induction they tend to be too busy to look at the tirade of documents that they've been sent um that tell them their rights so we're um trying to communicate the with them in a multiple different ways amazing amazing um but uh, so you have a lot of uh, SaaS doctors in your, you did you say, in eight service lines. How does your organization gather the views of SaaS doctors? Is there any forum or any feedbacks or survey, something that you do? So uh, um, that's what we've started. To, so we, um, it was, God, was it? Uh, yeah, it was a year ago. We um, designed this um, series of two workshops, whole day workshops where we gathered them together um, really had to make a lot of effort to make sure um, they were off site, mm. that their um, line managers allowed them to come. They didn't have to use study leave or anything. Um, so it was getting them in a room so that those turned into kind of focus groups where we uh, we did um, some we used a technique called appreciative inquiry. Um, and in the second workshop, what was really lovely and they really valued it was we invited trust leaders in. So the medical director, um, the, the um, uh, deputy chief executives, the workforce director, the R&D director, the mentoring lead um, and HR. And they didn't come as experts. They came to be listened uh, to, to listen to the SAS doctors. So they were invited for uh, and SAS doctors spoke to them, told them what they needed to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, all those leaders found it very humbling and um, were surprised by a lot of what they were told. So what's happened as a result of that is that we've got this kind of core group of people we've managed to engage, gain trust. And so now we're doing that as a regular um, half day workshop every few months. Um, so we're we're much more connected to them. So that's where we gather feedback. Brilliant. That's brilliant. And I hope other trusts could do the same. <laughs> uh, we're moving on to the next segment is going to is called rapid fire questions. If OK, <laughs> and we're going to repeat the same questions in all the interviews. And if you okay. were meeting face to face, you could have you could actually choose from some of the cards. All right. But because we're meeting on teams, um, I get to choose the questions. Okay. <laughs> Just four of them. I think you've already answered, to be honest, uh, Amrit, in, during this our conversation. But 
Here we go. So just quick and candid answers, really, whatever comes to your mind. First one, what does SAS or SAS stand for? Specialty and specialist doctors. Amazing. <laughs> How many SAS doctors are there in your trust? We think about 40, but we're actually really bad at accounting for especially the agency and locum. Brilliant. And can you name three SAS doctors uh, in your trust? Just the first names. Um, Evan, uh, Carla, Armin. Super. And um, last one, just name one formal leadership role that is occupied by a SAS doctor in your organisation. It's the SAS tutor. SAS tutor. Is it Evan? Yeah. Brilliant. Um, this, uh, towards, we're going towards the end of the interview, uh, but for our viewers and for myself as well, um, if you can tell us about a bit about your own developmental journey, um, how have you got to this amazing position? Um, so uh, I trained, I, uh, well, I did my undergraduate in Southampton um and always knew I wanted to be a psychiatrist from the very young age of about 12 because I'm nosy um and then uh, but really enjoyed medicine and I wanted to be a psychiatrist who knew about medicine so I did a medical rotation um and then did my psychiatry on um core training Went off traveling for about a year, then came back and did my higher training in Guys and St. Thomas's. Um, and then um, within that also did some psychotherapy training, um, which I think is really fantastic and did a lot of teaching. So liaison psychiatry for me was fantastic because I get to do teaching, I get to do psychotherapy, I get to do leadership, I get to do all the things I really enjoy doing. Um, and then... Um, came to West London. I've been in West London for 17 years um, and um, have been a clinical lead and a clinical director and um, had medical education leadership roles. Um, probably the most um, powerful um, developmental journey I went through was becoming a fellow of the Health Foundation and doing um, a, a master's in leadership of quality improvement and that was a very um it was an amazing um experience to go through and i'm still in contact with my cohort um from uh, we finished six years ago um we still do prn coaching for each other because you get to know each other so well so you have to kind of look at yourself look at how um it gets you a lot to think about how you impact other people um and it gets you really um being courageous about being authentic and vulnerable and i think that's been a really important journey for me amazing amazing this leads to maybe a question for the other sales doctors for their own motivation do you think uh a good sales doctor uh, reached to this point where you are to this position where you are at this point of time in your organization um. in my organization in the in the college i mean i want to get to a point where that question shouldn't even have to be asked um it, it should that it, it that it upsets me that we have to ask that question but i and i think it's completely of course why not yeah. um there's so many talented and dedicated people out there in SAS roles. Um, so, of course. Uh, and uh, I mean, my my journey has been about authenticity and tenacity and resilience, but also um, about having people who've sponsored me and um, given me the platform. Mm -hmm. So I've been lucky. Um, so it is about both, um, but there's been times when I have been sidelined and excluded and gaslit and all of those things that your uh, listeners out there will be experiencing. Um, and it's hard. Absolutely. It's hard to come back from it. Um, but uh, yeah, what doesn't kill you does make you stronger, it seems. 
absolutely. And with your inspiration for trainees, consultants, and sales doctors alike. Thank you so much for your time. Really, really. Thank you so much for um, inviting me, and it's lovely to meet you. <laughs> meet you as well, person. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye bye.